Hello everyone, welcome to TCOM 101. Dr. Mike here. In this video, I want to talk about the specialized and also the personalized stages in the developmental history of television. Of course, specialization really started in the 1980s with the rise of cable TV. And now we've seen the rise of streaming, which indicates personalized media. All right, but let's talk about the development of what we call multi-channel media. Things like cable TV and direct broadcast satellite and even streaming. These are platforms that can provide thousands and thousands of different unique channels of programming and information. Okay, now this really started to take off in the 1980s with the development of coaxial cable, cable TV, and the rise of satellites and satellite communication. So it was the emergence of cable TV that led to specialization. At first, cable TV was really just about extending over-the-air TV coverage. We can trace cable TV, CATV, back to the late 1940s. Okay, and it stood for Community Antenna Television, CATV. This was a giant antenna put up on a hillside. It was an early version of cable that delivered the existing over-the-air stations to homes out in the rural areas in the valleys that couldn't get the signal without the help of this giant community antenna. So this was the first thing, the kind of technology that kind of looked like cable. Now I'd like to talk about the contributions of the man pictured here. He made an amazing prediction in the 1940s that geostationary or geosynchronous satellites would be the ideal telecommunication relays. Do you know who this person was? A clue. 2001, A Space Odyssey. This was, of course, Arthur C. Clarke. He came up with the idea of the geostationary satellite back in the 1940s. So he's a British author who's credited, credited with envisioning the key elements of satellite communication. And he did this before we even had the technical skills and the political will to implement his ideas. Anyway, Arthur C. Clarke made an amazing prediction in the mid-1940s. In 1945, he published a plan to put electronic relay stations into space. Now, what was brilliant was that he came up with this idea of 22,300 miles above the equator. That's a magical spot because if you put a satellite at that altitude, it will orbit the Earth at the same speed that the Earth is spinning. So it will appear to be stationary and therefore very easy to track the signals coming from the satellite. This is called geosynchronous orbit. This place, 22,300 miles above the equator, is where hundreds of communication satellites sit today. And those are the satellites that give us a lot of the telephone and data and television service that we depend upon. So the geosynchronous satellite. Okay, speaking of satellites, do you know about the history of satellites? The very first one was 1957. It was the Russians who put up Sputnik and launched the dawn of the space age. In 1957, the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, was launched and by the Soviet Union. And of course, this triggered the great space race. Now, let's talk about rockets. Rockets, the idea of liquid-fueled rockets, goes back to the 1920s. And the best-known name is Robert Goddard, a U.S. professor and scientist. And he really learned how to use liquid fuel as a rocket, as a means of controlling very carefully the thrust and keeping the rocket positioned in a way that it could work. Do you know about Werner von Braun? He was one of the leading figures in the development of rocket technology. He was a war criminal in Nazi Germany who became America's leading U.S. rocket scientist. 
Werner von Braun brought us one of the first weapons of mass destruction, the V-2 rocket that was aimed at Britain during World War II. After the war, okay, we invited a number of German rocket scientists to the United States, and many of them ended up leading our space program here in America. Okay, these are the same people, okay, who committed atrocities using rocket technology in World War II. But anyway, we brought them to the United States, and in 1958, Werner von Braun and his team was able to launch Explorer 1. That was America's first satellite, and this was America's birth into the space program. Okay, then there were a number of other experiments with satellite. Did you know the first communication satellite was actually a huge balloon? This was launched high into the atmosphere and a radio signal could be bounced off it. 1960 Echo 1. But really the first important communication satellite was Telstar, AT&T's Telstar. This was the first important active and commercial satellite, okay, AT&T's Telstar in 1962. And it helped provide some of the first transatlantic television broadcast signals. Okay, 1963 is when we saw America's and the world's first geosynchronous communication satellite, SYNCOM-2, was launched into orbit 22,300 miles above the equator establishing a presence there in geosynchronous orbit. So that's where most of the important satellites are today. There are many, many lower orbit satellites, and we'll talk about a more recent experiment here in a few slides. Anyway, did you know how it takes rocketry to launch a satellite? And this is amazing technology. Since the mid-1980s, satellites have been used to broadcast programming directly to viewers, to distribute advertising, to distribute data, to provide live news coverage. Satellites are very important parts of the communication infrastructure. Now, do you remember the space shuttle? That's what we used for years to get these satellites up into space and into orbit. The space shuttle was a manned orbital rocket and spacecraft that was operated by NASA 135 missions, only a couple of those were disasters, okay, and the space shuttle existed from 1981 to 2011. Now, since the space shuttle, we've been relying on the Russians to launch some of our astronauts up to the International Space Station, but we're also turning to a private company here in the United States, SpaceX, the one that's uh, owned by Elon Musk, okay? The same guy behind Tesla. All right, so SpaceX has taken over the role of launching satellites into space from the United States. So how do satellites work? Okay, well, you need an uplink transmitter. That's the dish here on Earth. It's a big dish and antenna that's pointed at the satellite. And it sends a signal to one of the satellite's transponders. So we push the message up to the satellite and to one of its transponders. The transponder is the technology that amplifies the signal, makes it stronger, and then shifts it to another frequency so that it can be transmitted back down to Earth. Now down here on Earth, we have a downlink antenna or receiver that captures that signal and then sends it on its way to our TVs or to a cable TV system. Now each satellite has a huge footprint or coverage area and some of these can be big enough to cover an entire continent. Now in the late 1970s, satellites started to be used to distribute HBO and a few other early services, and some consumers went out and actually bought a giant television receive-only dish, a TVRO. It became very popular, especially in the rural areas, for people who couldn't get any kind of cable TV. Some of these uh, still exist, okay, out in the, out in the boondocks of the countryside, you'll occasionally see one of these old satellite antennas. 
but the uh, satellite and dish technologies have both advanced and since the late 1980s we've seen something called direct broadcast satellite DBS and this system uses tiny dishes pizza sized dishes okay to collect satellite signals and these uh, DBS devices have been heavily used around the world. You're familiar with this. The brand names in America are Direct TV and Dish TV. Now here's something we don't normally think about, a kind of a different form of e-waste, and it's called space junk or space debris. You know, there's a half million pieces of this floating around the Earth. This is the collection of objects in orbit that were created by humans but no longer serve any purpose and these pose a threat not only to people in space but also to people on the ground. Some of this occasionally re-enters the atmosphere so there's another environmental problem to worry about. Millions of pieces of space junk. Anyway, satellites are very important today in terms of distributing okay, all kinds of our signals. Now, Satellites, along with cable TV, brought us the rise of this new industry called cable television. This started in the late 1970s and early 1980s. That's where we saw the first cable TV networks. So the first cable TV programming service was HBO. That was the very first cable TV programming service to be delivered across the nation via satellite and cable TV. And this is what attracted a lot of people early on to, to cable, the chance to watch uh, these exclusive movies on HBO. Okay. In the 1970s, we also saw the birth of WTBS, the country's first super station. What's a super station? That's a small station or an independent station, local station that suddenly gets distributed across the country using satellites and cable TV. TBS started out as a little TV station and became a major uh, cable television channel. Okay, what about ESPN? That brought a lot of people to cable. That's a cable TV network, or really a set of networks dedicated to broadcasting, broadcasting sports-related stuff. It goes back to 1979. And it really stands for the Entertainment and Sports Programming Network, ESPN. Of course, now it's owned by the mouse, Walt Disney. Okay, another early important cable TV network was CNN. That was launched in 1980 by somebody named Ted Turner, who was a big mogul, an important player in the history of TV. But this was the first 24-hour cable TV news service. Okay? And it became successful, and it spawned several other 24-hour cable network news services, including Fox News and MSNBC. MTV, I remember the beginning of MTV back in 1981. And of course, the original purpose back then was to actually show music videos. This company is today owned by Viacom, CBS. But it played an important, and it's not as big as it used to be, but it played a major role in the history of cable TV and the popular music industry. Let's go back a little to Ted Turner. He was one of the entrepreneurs responsible for rethinking the way that America used TV, especially cable TV back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. During that period, where we saw the growth of specialization in TV, Ted Turner was very important, okay, a very important player. Why? Because he brought us the Cartoon Network, CNN, the Headline News Network, Turner Broadcasting, TNT, TBS, Turner Classic Movies, a number of important cable TV brands and channels. Now, eventually, a big giant company purchased Ted Turner's cable TV empire in the 1990s. That was Time Warner, which today, of course, is known as Warner Media, and it is today a subsidiary of AT&T, the telephone giant. 
Okay, let me uh, also talk about another very recent happening in the world of satellites, and that's this interesting uh, technology known as Starlink. Starlink. These are low orbit satellites, low cost, low orbit satellites, and SpaceX is trying to create a constellation of these satellites. Why? Because they could beam down low cost, powerful internet access. This technology might help close the digital divide. So the Starlink project would consist of thousands of mass produced small satellites. They've already launched hundreds of these into low Earth orbit. So they work in combination with ground transceivers to create low cost internet signals that are coming to us directly off of satellites. So that's an amazing, amazing um, recent development and experiment. Okay, let's shift back to the idea of multi-channel media. A lot of these services today offer over a thousand different channels. Okay. These are amazing technologies that have emerged in the 21st century. We can call them multi-channel okay, or mega-channel technologies. Okay. Because we really live now in an era of media abundance. We no longer have a scarcity of media. We have an abundance. We have so much to consume that it's overwhelming. We cannot consume it all. One place of abundance is digital cable. This is the, the advanced cable TV service, which uses compression technology so that it can deliver thousands and thousands of different channels and on demand or streaming choices. Okay, so in the late 1990s, the cable industry, the analog cable industry began to invest heavily in digitally based distribution systems. They knew the future was in digital. Cable companies, customers wanted more channels, more on-demand programming, more digital music, and they wanted broadband. So cable had to respond. Okay, now upgrade to digital cable. Yes, it's great. You get better picture and sound quality. You get, you know, a huge universe of channels, greatly expanded channel counts. You get some new interactive services, a lot of new pay-per-view and video on demand services and digital music channels. These are all great advantages of digital cable. So by 2011, nearly all the cable providers were offering digital service to their customers. The number one cable, TV, and broadband service provider in the United States is Comcast. Comcast has currently about 22 million cable TV subscribers, and it currently has about 29 million broadband or internet subscribers. Now, another popular form of multi-channel distribution is direct broadcast satellite, DBS. This is a digital TV service that brings the signals directly from satellites right to the home receivers. You know this as direct TV and dish TV, the small uh, roof and, and yard place dishes that grab uh, the digital signals from the satellite. 1994 is when DirecTV began. 1996 saw the launch of the Dish Network. Now, DBS has a lot of great advantages. You get great pictures, digital pictures. You get expanded channel counts, the interactivity, the pay-per-view, the digital music channels. You know, the big disadvantage of DBS? Weather interference. Okay, rain and clouds can block the signals, right? especially when you need the, the warning surveillance the most, you lose the TV signal. But these, uh, these companies have lost a lot of subscribers, so has uh, digital cable recently because of the rise of streaming. But they still have uh, a lot of customers. Direct TV serves about 16 million households, DishNet about 11 million households. But the direction the industry is heading, of course, is cord cutting. Many consumers are replacing cable and satellite, getting rid of Comcast or DirecTV, and replacing it, those services with streaming, 
This is called cord cutting or cable cutting. Cable TV and streaming companies are battling it out to offer a great subscriber experience. Okay? And it seems right now that streaming is definitely on the rise here. And we've seen an explosive growth of amazing streaming services in the past few years. Okay, the streaming wars it's referred to. And Netflix has grown to an incredibly huge global company with 190 million subscribers. So, cable cutters, as more Americans rely entirely on the internet and companies like Netflix and Disney Plus for their TV, many are canceling their pay TV services like cable TV and satellite TV. So we can expect to see more cable cutting and more people shifting over to streaming. Well, that's all the time we've got for this video. I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Dr. Mike, so long.